Hello. For this particular activity, we're going to set up a spreadsheet to look at ideal gas pressure and real gas pressure as shown through the van der Waals equation for the same conditions of amount, temperature, and volume. In other words, we're going to look at containers with a rigid volume and see how the pressure of an ideal or real gas will differ under these circumstances. To better do this and understand this, we are going to use a spreadsheet. For those of you who have used spreadsheets before, this video will hopefully really introduce nothing new to you. But for those of you who haven't used spreadsheets before, this is a great opportunity to start learning a tool that is going to be useful for you in the future. For this video, I'm using Google Sheets. If you have access to another spreadsheet program that you're familiar with, feel free to use that one. If you don't have access to a spreadsheet program, I'm choosing Google Sheets because it is available for free. You would need to set up some sort of Google account, and effectively what you're going to find is here I am now in just the generic Google search homepage. I've got my account I've made here for my open educational resources, and I'm just going to go here to my apps to find Sheets. And that's going to get me here to the spreadsheet part of what's going on. You'll notice that I've already got a few spreadsheets here as I started practicing what's going on, but we are going to build this spreadsheet fresh. Now my plan is to go through this fairly quickly. You're always going to have the ability to pause and rewind the video, so of course don't feel like you're missing anything. Just go back and review and see how you've done things. If you're using a different spreadsheet, usually what I'm going to do will work exactly the same for your spreadsheet. If not, you're going to have to do a bit of internet searching just to figure out how to do the same kind of thing in the particular program you're using. But with no further ado, let's get started by creating our blank spreadsheet and start creating the data section for what we're going to accomplish with this particular spreadsheet. To accomplish this, first of course we have to create our blank spreadsheet, and that's the best one we have. So I'm going to go to my plus blank here, and you're going to see effectively a spreadsheet. Let's give this a name. So I'm going to rename this here, Gas Laws Notebook Plus Spreadsheet Activity. Pretty simple and straightforward to do that. You'll notice that it's saved automatically to the Google Drive that would come along with this. Most of you, again, hopefully have experience with spreadsheets, but if you don't, let's talk very quickly about cells and cell references. Here we see in my blue little rectangle, I'm just going to move it around a bit here, and I put it back here. Effectively, that blue rectangle is highlighting what is called a cell. That cell has an address, just like you do at your house or apartment or wherever you live. In this case, the address is given by the column letter and the row number. This is column A and row 1. Therefore, this cell is referred to as cell A1, which we can see right here. Here we've got the name box. This is going to be useful for us when we do future referencing to pieces of information. So now I plan on creating a data section for what's going on. I figured out beforehand that I'm going to need about three columns if I want to include the variable name, the actual value of the piece of data, and the units of what's going on. It also makes sense when I create a spreadsheet to maybe do a little bit of organizing so I know what's going on. So I'm going to create what I call the data section in my spreadsheet. And since I know there's kind of three different pieces, the variable name, the value, and the unit that I want to put into the data section for each thing, it seems like three columns makes a lot of sense. So what I'm going to do is highlight the first three cells in row one, columns A, B, and C, and I'm actually going to merge these together. Now you see here that we've got select merge type. I'm going to merge them all, and really what you see is that turns those three cells into one bigger cell. And that means I can put in something like data section, and click enter. It's going to fill that three cells, but to make this look nice, let's actually go here and maybe do a center alignment. Now we see that these three columns are essentially giving our data section. There's going to be certain pieces of information I'm going to want to include in this. Since we're dealing with the gas laws, we're going to want to know the number of moles. 
we're going to want to know the temperature of the gas. However, it turns out that temperature could be in degrees Celsius, but we may also be interested, and in fact, we know we're going to be interested in having this temperature in Kelvin. And that's because we've seen, especially according to Charles's law, that you have to have gas temperatures in Kelvin because it's absolute temperature on the Kelvin scale that the ideal gas law actually works with and not in Celsius. And the easiest way to realize this is if we use Celsius and we were at the freezing point of water, zero degrees Celsius, well, if I plug in zero into the ideal gas law, it's going to tell me that at zero degrees Celsius, all gases have zero pressure. And we know that's not true. Now, in the meantime, I've realized that, wait a second, I forgot my units for amount of gas. So I'm going to go back up here and just type in moles. Now, there's two pieces of data that we would need for the ideal gas law. We saw that there are four state variables, pressure, volume, amount, and temperature. Well, pressure we're going to be calculating using the spreadsheet. Volume we're going to be very interested in, the volume of rigid containers, but we're going to want to imagine several different ones. So we're not going to put that in the data section. In other words, we're going to use volume as our independent variable and see how the pressure changes with the change in volume. So it's not going to be part of our data section. But there are a few more pieces of information that are going to be very, very useful for us. Of course, if we're dealing with the ideal gas law, we need the gas constant. We've seen that the gas constant takes many, many different values depending on the units that we're measuring things in. While I would love to uh, set up this spreadsheet uh, using pressure in bar, it turns out the textbook, and especially the van der Waals factors in the textbook, use atmospheres. So I'm going to choose atmospheres instead, which means the value of the gas constant I'm going to need is 0 0.08206. And that has units of liters atmosphere per Kelvin per mole. And you notice that I'm using kind of caret minus one to indicate the raising to the negative power, which means we're really dividing. Now you're going to notice, wait a second, this unit has kind of bled over the size of my cell. If I wanted to type something in here, there's going to be an overlap and covering up. If this kind of thing happens, go to the right hand side of your column label until you get the double arrows and double click. And you'll see that the column will resize itself to fit everything in. Now, it turns out that in the calculations of the ideal gas pressure, as well as the van der Waals pressure, there's going to be a common thing in there. Both of those equations of state ultimately have nRT as a chunk in there. So why don't we actually build that into our data section? So nRT equals, and what we're going to find is when we do nRT equals, we are essentially going to get uh, effectively two units left over. What we're going to have is NRT ultimately gives us liter atmosphere. Dimensional analysis would show this to you. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, just play around with the units and figure out for yourself that this is true. Now, there's a few more things we're going to need before we start maybe throwing some numbers in our data section. In this particular case, since we're going to be using the van der Waals equation of state, we're going to need data for the van der Waals, essentially, attraction, intermolecular force of attraction factor, A, and the excluded volume factor, B, for whatever particular gas we're interested in. So why don't we just build in a section for those? Van der Waals factor A would equal. Now it turns out van der Waals factor A has some very specific units. Um, I'm going to have to think a little bit about those. Uh, and in fact, it shouldn't be that hard. Uh, so it's a times n squared over v squared, which means I'm going to need a to have units of v squared over n squared. In other words, the units are going to be liters squared per mole. 
square. And then we're going to have a van der Waals factor B. That's again the excluded volume, and effectively that's going to be liters per mole. And with that in mind, I forgot one unit in here because we have to see how the pressure is affected by the actual attractive intermolecular forces. So I forgot that there's going to be a unit of bar here as well. So it's bar liter squared per mole squared. And luckily you see that it's relatively easy to fix that mistake. Let's put some placeholder numbers in here for now. Let's call this 1.00 and this called 0.05. You're going to notice that, that 1.00 didn't stay as 1.00. It essentially went to the counting number, so I'm just going to increase the decimal places until I have, let's say, two decimal places in there. For moles, let's start with 1.00. Again, we're going to find, oh, wait, I'm going to need to increase those decimal places so I've got a little more data. And for now, let's take temperature 0.00 and again increase those decimal places. So now we have all kind of our data section, but there's a couple of calculations that we want to do in here. So this will be our first introduction into using a spreadsheet to do calculations for you. So let's do our first simple calculation, which is going to be the conversion of our temperature from degrees Celsius into Kelvin. Now we know the conversion factor for that is you take any temperature in degrees Celsius and you add 273.15 to that to give the same temperature on the Kelvin scale. So let's do that. In other words, here, when we want our temperature in Kelvin, this is actually a calculation we're going to do. And that calculation is, and usually when we do calculations, we're going to start with the equal sign. And what it's going to equal, in this case, is the 273.15 that we add to the temperature in degrees Celsius. Now, we've already got that temperature in degrees Celsius in cell B4. So what I'm going to do is click on cell B4, and what you notice is that we actually see that propagate into our formula. In other words, what we have is potentially a changeable calculation for us. If I change the temperature in B4, I should see the temperature in B5 change as a result. In other words, it recalculates upon change. So when I press enter here, of course, we see zero degrees Celsius is 273.15 Kelvin, but if I was interested in the temperature being 25 degrees Celsius, well, if I change this to 25 and enter, you notice that now my Kelvin temperature has changed as well because we've referred to the address and the piece of information which can change, and that's going to update our new calculated value. This is the main purpose of a spreadsheet is to help redo things and see how things change for you. Using the same idea, we can do the same for our NRT calculation. In this case, it's going to be the number of moles, which is in cell B3, times, excuse me, our gas constant R, which is in cell B7, times our temperature in Kelvin, which is B5. So if I were to change any of these values, this calculated value of NRT is going to change just like we saw that the converted Kelvin temperature changes when we change the degrees Celsius. I press enter, and what I get here is 24.46. Now let's just check to see if we've did this calculation correctly. I'm going to change my temperature back to 0 degrees Celsius, and now we're talking about the idea that at zero degrees Celsius, and if we pretended we were at a pressure of one atmosphere, this is standard temperature and pressure, and we've seen the molar volume of the gas at that set of conditions is about 22.4 liters. Well, here we have 22.4, so again, this is liter atmosphere, but if we multiply by one atmosphere, you're going to see that we get 22.4. So this gives me a sense that our calculation has been done correctly. Again, if I change the temperature, we are going to find that that changes. If I change the number of moles, we're going to find that NRT now changes. And this, again, is the power of the spreadsheet for us. But before we move on, let's change these back. So now we're going to introduce our 
independent variable, the variable that we're going to choose to change to see how one other variable would change. It turns out the independent variable is the volume. Again, you could imagine we have steel cylinders of very specific sizes that we're going to be talking about, and the pressure of a certain amount of gas at a given temperature inside that particular volume. So for this, I'm going to create a column label that says here we're talking about a volume in liters. I'm going to skip over a row just to keep things nice and orderly. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with a volume of 1.00 liters. Of course, it didn't really like that in terms of uh, decimal places, so I've increased that. And what we're going to do is we're going to take progressively larger and larger volumes. And how we're going to do that is say, well, let's take our next cell. And what I'm going to do is say that cell represents that a volume that is 1.00. In other words, the cell above. And to that, I'm going to add 0.05 liters. And of course, when I press enter, I get 1.05. But something interesting is going to happen. You notice we have this reference here, E3 plus 0 0.05. In other words, it's essentially saying, look at the cell right above and add 0.5 to that. Well, if you see this little blue box here on our blue rectangle, hold your mouse button down and drag down one. And what do you notice if I actually look on that cell is that's now become E4 plus 0 0.05. As we drag down in the spreadsheet, it will automatically change the row number of the reference until, unless you tell it not to. So effectively, what we've done is create an equation that says add 0 0.05 to the cell above. And that means that we can quickly redo this calculation just by dragging down. Now I'm going to drag down to about cell 83 here, or, or row 83. Whoops, I missed one. And here we go. Because really what I'm interested in is we're going to look at cylinder volumes from 1 liter to 5 liter and see how the pressure changes or is different between the ideal and real gas for this particular set of conditions. But now you see one of the real utilities of a spreadsheet. Instead of having to do each one of those calculations by hand and typing that all in, they have built it in such a way that it's going to do it for us. Now, before we worry about the gas pressures, since part of what I want you to figure out in this particular activity is the contributions of the attractive and repulsive intermolecular forces to how a real gas pressure is different from the ideal gas pressure, what I'm going to do is build in two columns where we calculate kind of the individual pieces of the van der Waals equation. That is namely, what I'm going to do, and perhaps what I'll do is I'll merge these two cells and talk about the IMFs. And again, I might want to just put the central so that looks nice. And I'm going to do attractive and repulsive. And again, what I might want to do just to make things look nice is to center those. Now, we've seen in the van der Waals equation, there's effectively the two contributions, the attractive part that modifies the ideal gas pressure and the repulsive part, which modifies the ideal gas pressure. That attractive part effectively is the negative of the van der Waals factor A multiplied by the number of moles squared divided by the volume squared. We have the volumes in the column just to the left, we have the number of moles given in our data section. But what we see is the number of moles we always wanted to stay the same, while the volume we wanted to change. So we're going to have to use some sort of trickery to make sure that the volume changes when we want it to, but the number of moles doesn't. And it turns out there's a way to do that in spreadsheets, and that's by fixing addresses, whether by column, by row, or both. So again, these attractive intermolecular forces are going to equal the negative of the van der Waals factor A multiplied by the number of moles squared divided by the volume 
squared. Now notice we're using cell references here. The problem is the van der Waals factor A and the number of moles we don't want to change. So if we were to pull down, it's going to want to change those cell references to B4, which is actually temperature data and not what we want, or B12, which is the van der Waals factor B, which we don't want. So anytime there's a particular cell that we don't want to move off of when we redo calculations by dragging, what we're going to do is introduce dollar signs to freeze certain parts. So if our number of moles is in cell B3 and we don't want that to change, I'm going to put a dollar sign in front of B, which says don't make any changes if I move across a column. And I'm going to put a dollar sign in front of the three, which says don't make any changes to the cell reference if I go down the row. We're going to want to do the same thing with the van der Waals factor for A. So let's freeze B and freeze 11. But the volume, we're going to want to change as we drag down. So when we do the volume of E4, we're going to want this E3 here to become E4. Well, it turns out we don't need to type that because the spreadsheet's going to do the work for us. So let me put enter in here. You notice it says let's do an autofill. Uh, so yeah, yeah. So effectively what the autofill is saying is let's drag down that little blue thing and you'll see that it auto fills all the way down to our last volume. Now, the numbers aren't necessarily looking all that nice for us, so let's effectively just highlight all of them and let's go to, oh, let's say four decimal places, just so we can see some of the change of what's going on. And so what we see is right now, because the van der Waals factor A is one, in other words, the molecules have some stickiness to them, there is going to be some reduction in pressure caused by the attractive intermolecular forces. To check whether this calculation has worked well, let's change our van der Waals factor to A, and what we see is all of them change to zero when I change A to zero. If there's no attractions, there's no modification to the intermolecular forces. So that seems to be doing okay. I'm going to change this back to one. Let's do the same for the repulsive intermolecular forces. Now the repulsive intermolecular forces in the van der Waals equation would be nRT divided by the volume minus the number of moles times the van der Waals factor B. Well, we've already done nRT. So here's our nRT, but again, we're not going to want to change that when we start moving calculations around. So let's fix our cell reference. In other words, NRT is always going to stay right there. And then we're going to take this NRT, we're going to divide it by the number of, sorry, we're going to divide it by the volume here, which is something we will want to change. So we're not going to freeze any variables, minus the number of moles times the van der Waals factor B. Now those number of moles in van der Waals factor B, we don't want to change, so let's freeze those. And boom, enter. And so it again suggests autofill, so let's do that. Let's highlight them again and let's say show this all to four decimal places, way too many. So let's take it back to four decimal places. There we go. And what you see is, of course, repulsive intermolecular forces are going to tend to increase pressure. So you see a positive number, while the attractive intermolecular forces are going to tend to decrease pressure. And so you see a negative number. So next, let's calculate both the ideal and van der Waals gas pressures for the given sets of conditions we have. Again, let's make things nice here. So what I might do is merge these cells. Where are we? There we are. Pressure. And we might as well make sure that we're including units here. It's going to be the pressure in the atmosphere. Let's center that again to make it look nice. Now there's two different kinds of pressure we're going to be talking about. We're going to be talking about the ideal pressure. And we're going to talk about the van der Waals pressure. So we're going to have two separate calculations for that. Uh, let's enter those again just to make it look really nice. And what we're going to find is this. 
the ideal gas pressure. If PV equals NRT, then that's NRT over V, which means that's going to equal our NRT value over here. Again, we are going to want to fix that. And we're going to divide this by the volume. Now that we are going to want to change, so we're not going to fix that. And again, it's going to ask if we want to autofill. Yes, we do. Highlight. Let's go those two four decimal places. There we go. Just so we've got a sense of what's going on. Now the van der Waals pressure is going to be NRT divided by V minus NB, effectively our attract, uh, our repulsive part, added together with the attractive part. That's the van der Waals equation. Go back to your notes if you're not sure what's going on. But effectively, what that's going to be is our repulsive part plus our attractive part. Now we see both of those change with volume, so we don't want to freeze any of those. And let's do our autofill. And you notice this time it actually gave them two four decimal places for us, which is great. So let's just do a few little checks here. First check that we can do is the notion of the compression factor Z, which we essentially saw is a comparison of the real gas pressure at a given set of uh, variables compared to the ideal gas pressure. In other words, it's going to be our van der Waals pressure divided by our ideal pressure. And again, let's autofill. Let's take it down to four decimal places. And what you notice is, wow, we're pretty close to one right now, but not exactly one. Great way to check whether things are going fine. Let's take our van der Waals factors both down to zero. There are no attractions and there are no repulsions. Oops, no decimal places there. And so what we find is this. Now, the van der Waals gas is effectively behaving like an ideal gas, and what we see is our pressures are the same. There's no attractive intermolecular forces. The repulsive intermolecular forces don't actually exist, so we're not modifying the volume to deal with the excluded volume of molecules. And so what you notice is the repulsive and ideal gas pressures are the same, and that's why the compression factor ends up being one in all these cases. Well, we've just set up our spreadsheet. In a moment, I'm going to show you how to make some graphs so you can start working on answering the questions, but let's just go through a few different things. I can change the number of moles easily, and we will see that our numbers will change. I can change our van der Waals factors to whatever ones I want from reading in a table or just making up a pretend molecule with certain factors, and that's going to have some effect on what's going on. I can change my temperature. And that's going to make a big difference in what's going on. Technically, I could even change my value of R, the gas constant. It makes no sense in our universe because the universe has one and only one gas constant. But we could pretend. What if we lived in a different universe where the gas constant is different? There will, in fact, be one question where I'm going to ask you to answer that. So now, let's look at making some graphs to really better understand the differences in real and ideal gas behavior. So for this activity, you're essentially going to use two different graphs to get a better understanding of what's going on. The first will be a pressure versus volume graph that shows both the ideal and the van der Waals graph, uh, gas pressure on the same graph. The second graph will be the compression factor versus volume so you can get a sense of how different the real gas pressure is from the ideal gas pressure at a certain set of conditions, including a given volume. Now, for the pressure versus volume graphs, what we're going to do is we're going to highlight three different columns. We're essentially going to highlight our volume. So let's drag that. And you notice I'm keeping my label in there. And now I'm going to use the control key on my keyboard to get both pressure columns as well. Whoops. And I lost my selection there, so let's go back. And there we have our three selected columns. 
our independent variable volume and our two dependent variables, the pressure and how they change with what's going on. I'm going to go to insert chart. And what kind of chart do I want? I'm going to want, let's say, a line chart. And in fact, it's suggested and we see a sense of what it looks like. We have a little bit of what's going on. Uh, we're going to want to make a few changes to our labels here, but for the moment, we have the graph that we want. We're going to fiddle around a little bit once I get things back to where I want them. In the meantime, I'm going to go to these three dots here and move this to my own sheet. Uh, and I'm going to rename this so I know this is my pressure volume graph. And while I'm at it, why don't I rename my original sheet uh, my calculations. This helps you keep track and let you put things in several different places. We're going to mess around and alter this graph a little bit to make it better to understand what's going on. But first, let's go back and do our second graph. And that is that we're going to talk about volume as our independent variable and compression factor. And we're going to want to make a graph for that as well. So I'm going to insert another chart. It gives us effectively line chart as the suggested one. That works for me. And again, we're going to move this to its own sheet, which I'm going to call compression factor. Graph, let's see. All great. Now we're going to alter these a little bit, but before we do, I just want to go back and make a few little changes. Let's get ourselves back to kind of our STP conditions of one mole, zero degrees Celsius. Of course, our gas constant is the same. And yeah, we've got some reasonable van der Waals factors here. So now we're going to modify our graphs just a little bit to make them nice to work off of. And then between looking at the numbers and the graphs, you're going to be able to answer some questions. But you notice how setting up all these calculations, we literally have 80 pressure and volume calculations. Something went wrong. Oh no. Well, looks like we're fine. Let me just check my graphs again. Seem to be doing okay. And there we go. So yeah, we're doing okay. So let's move in to just making those graphs look a little nicer for what we're going to be doing. Because you're going to want to show some screenshots of these graphs and maybe some of this data as part of answering your notebook questions. So let's format our graphs a little bit so we're focusing on some nice bits and pieces and we're better able to, by just looking at how the graphs change when we change this, uh, make some changes to pieces of information, uh, how that's going to help us better understand real and ideal gas behavior. Let's go back to our pressure volume graph here. You notice our bounds are from 1 to 5 here. It's not really showing that last bound, so let's double click here. We're going to see our horizontal axis. It has the right uh, situation of volume in liters, uh, log scale, slant labels from source data. It seems like we're going okay, but let's maybe put in a few uh, minor ticks and grid lines in here just so we've got a better sense of what's going on. And yeah, so we've got a few more things there. And you'll notice that here we have the pressure. We don't really have a um, label for it, uh, but we could set our minimum and maximum values. Right now I feel we're doing pretty good with that. So let's just make some uh, slight changes here. Let's go to our title. It's actually the ideal and van der Waals gas pressure in atmosphere versus rigid container volume in liters. And now we've got a very good sense of what this graph is actually showing us. A good title can make all the difference. Now we do want uh, to have our legend. We've got the ideal in van der Waals pressure. It would really be nice to see our uh, vertical axis have a label on it. I seem 
to find no label here and that happens to be how we did things i'm not going to worry too much about it especially if you put a good label in there so yeah we've now formatted this graph to give us a little bit better let's maybe uh, throw in some uh, minor and major grid lines and ticks in here as well so we can get some really good sense of how things are going so yeah this is our graph modified a bit to hopefully better show us what's going on let's do the same for our compression factor graph now here you're going to notice that right now we've got a blue line uh, effectively around one what this means is that our ideal gas and our van der Waals gas at these particular sets of conditions are behaving almost identically. When the compression factor is near one, that's your real gas behaving next to ideal. So this graph is going to show us some interesting stuff. But you notice there's a lot of dead space here that we're probably not going to want. So we might want to change our graph to show us from a range of, let's say, 0 0.750 for the compression factor to 1.250. So I'm going to double click here. Let's change our minimum value to 0.75, our maximum value to 1.25. And of course, we're going to want uh, maybe some more major and minor grid lines in here. Now, what would be really useful is if we had a one on here since we know that's a special number so let's maybe just change these a little bit from uh, 0.75 to 0 0.70 and let's say 0 0.30 does that give us a one in here yes it does and that's going to be really helpful for us so now we see a good sense we see our volume scale again uh, is fine it would really be nice to see that last number but let's maybe get in some more grid lines and ticks just so we can see what's on the go a little better there so at this point you should have a spreadsheet that looks like mine both in terms of the graphs and the numbers you can see my numbers right here one mole zero degrees celsius my value of r my nrt here we go if you're getting numbers that are wildly different you're going to need to check what's going on because there's a mistake somewhere Again, there are certain ways to help you check. If we change our van der Waals factors to zero, you're going to find that, of course, our compression factor should always become one. If it doesn't, there's an error in your calculation somewhere. So do little things to play around just to see if everything is going to work out the way you want. In the meantime, I'm going to leave them as he at here for you to check. But now you've built a spreadsheet that is going to help you do this assignment or this activity. Look at the questions, make the changes in your spreadsheet, usually in the data section, and see how the graphs change. You're going to want to use screenshots and pictures of your graphs to make your case. So effectively, if it's like if I change the number of moles from one moles to four moles, show me the graph with one mole and the graph with four moles, and then talk about what's changed in terms of the difference of van der Waals and ideal gas pressure and the compression factor in that new set of conditions. So you're all ready to do a spreadsheet activity on gases. Good luck.